Thank you for watching this recording of Finding Healing Through Collaborative Restoration. During this recording, there are a few times that our speaker's microphones cut out. We apologize for any inconveniences and hope that you have a great time watching anyway. Hello everyone, welcome to the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center. We are so excited to have all of you joining us both in person and online. I'm Hunter Klingensmith, the Visitor Experience and Exhibit Manager here at Swanner, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Swanner and our programs before I pass the mic off to Sarah Woodbury, who will introduce Sageland Collaborative, our partner this evening, and she'll also introduce our speakers tonight. Tonight, we get to hear about a very special conservation project that braids indigenous knowledge, academic scientific pursuits, and rural views that serve to create long-term healing of both land and community. Our goal here at Swanner is to preserve, educate, and nurture both the land and our community. We feel that projects like this couldn't be more important in restoration efforts today. We would also like to recognize that Swanner Preserve and Eco Center resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone and the Ute Indian Tribe. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Before I pass you off to Sarah, I would also like to thank Summit County Rap Tax for supporting our walks, talks, and workshop series and allowing us to help everyone engage in nature. I would also like to go over a few logistics for tonight. We'll start off this evening by hearing from our three presenters. After their talks, we'll have time for a Q&A. We'll take a few questions from both the in-person and virtual audience. With that, I'll pass you off to Sarah. For the Huntsman Cancer, Cancer Institute, the Utah Humanities Board and the PBS Utah Board of Directors. He attended the University of Utah and Weber State University and received his bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis on history. He's also the author of The Bear River Massacre, A Shoshone History, and teaches Native American history at Utah State University. His passions in life are his wife, Melody, seven children, and 14 grandchildren. Wow. His other passion is his tribal family. He wants to make sure that those who have gone before him are not forgotten. Excited to have Darren with us. We also have Sarah Klein with us, who is the Andrew J. Senti Assistant Professor of Ecosystem Services at Utah State University. So she earned her Bachelor's of Arts at Reed College in Biology and Economics and then worked as a Geographic Information Systems Analyst. She has experience conducting sea turtle and crocodile conservation research in Micronesia. Um, her Master's of Science and then PhD are from the Institute for, uh, for Resources, Environment and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia. Her current research focuses are weaving indigenous local and scientific knowledge for conservation and finding ways to make renewable energy landscapes more socially acceptable and better for biodiversity. We're excited to have her with us as well. And then lastly, we have Will Munger, who is a PhD student at Utah State University. Um, and has done a lot of research with this project as well. He's also a professional cowboy, a state certified beaver wrangler. This is true. <laughs> he apparently has a belt buckle to prove it <laughs> and is a Mustang trainer. So we've got a lot of life and a lot of a wonderful experience here with us tonight. So thank you so much. We'll welcome Darren first. A podium is always my safety net and technology scares me to death so it's human nature to believe that our story whatever that is is the story the danger of carrying that view however is that we become calcified in our own value systems and we stay insulated it, in groups that parrot back our own confirmed biases and thoughts. I have come to realize over a lifetime that when we reduce history to just data, and when we remove the emotional or the storytelling side of history, we lose some of the humanity that makes history so important. And I believe that's why our story as indigenous people and the story of this land is so important. A couple of years ago, I moved to the beautiful Cache Valley. I get to wake up to the most spectacular views of the mountains each day, as you do here if you live here. I am thankful every day when I wake up for the teachings of my people. These mountains are sacred. They carry within them the peaks and valleys 
and the substances needed for life. From the water running down into our streams, to our valleys and the plants that are used as food and medicine, and the animals that we used to feed our families. My grandmother would always tell me to slow down, ponder the lessons that are being taught. There is a great natural order to the universe of which man is an integral part. We are endowed with the ability to observe, to learn, and to imitate this order. It is a relationship of giving and taking, what I like to call reciprocity. I remember as a young boy getting in my grandmother's car in Davis County and going on what I thought was the longest car ride in the world. And in reality, it was probably only an hour and a half to the Bear River Massacre site. Our first stop was always at the Daughters of Utah Pioneers Monument that happened to be on Highway 91, mostly to see if there was a new trinket or an offering that would be hung in the offering tree. We would then climb back into the car, cross the road, and make our way down Hot Springs Road until we climbed to the top of the bluff. There would we would get out and walk to the edge. This was, to me, one of the most beautiful places on earth. She would place a beautiful Pendleton blanket on the ground, and there we would sit for hours. It was here in that quiet moment that she would point certain things out to me that she'd always done on previous trips. At first, she would point out where the lodges were located and why they were located there. They were put close to the hill to protect them from the north winds that blew in the wintertime. She would point out where the grass wickiup was located, where her father, da grandfather Dabuzi found himself at the beginning of the fight. She told me how excited he must have been as a 12-year-old boy. She then pointed out the location on the killing field where Dabuzi laid more than four hours playing dead at the request of his grandmother. She said, keep your eyes closed at all times. This is the only way that your life is going to be spared. You see, this is how I grew up. Year after year, making the same pilgrimage to this sacred site. Hearing the stories from my elders who had heard the stories from their elders. It's the indigenous way. There's an old Indian saying that I love that says, when an old Indian dies, a library burns. And that was never as true as it was about those oral history telling people. The Shoshone people lived like their forefathers had lived for thousands of years. They were hunters and gatherers. They traveled with the changing seasons. They referred to themselves as Niwa, which means the people. We looked upon the earth as not just a place to live, but something so sacred and special that we called her mother. She was always the provider of our livelihoods. You see, to my native people, the mountains and the streams and the plains stand forever, and seasons walk around annually. We traveled to different parts when the game was plentiful and the seeds and berries were abundant. If you can imagine, it was probably a hard way of life. They were never more than a few days away from starvation, but it was a happy life. Back then, every member of the tribe played an important role in its survival. This relationship between the people and the land was sacred. The delicate balance in which the Shoshone people managed those precious food resources for thousands of years was drastically altered by colonization. In establishing those settlements, they plowed up the grasslands that provide wild seeds that were used as a food source for the Shoshone people. 
and destroyed plants that fed the buffalo and the deer and the elk. This lack of understanding between two cultures and the shortages of resources caused conflict over the land, food, and water. As a contemporary Shoshone man said, the Shoshones welcomed the settlers and tried to be hospitable, but really didn't realize what they had in mind. They retaliated when injustices were done to them, when their very survival was threatened, when their traditional way of life was made impossible. What else could they do? My people believed and still do that the earth and all of its creations came into being by that great spirit. As the designer and creator, the great spirit put into place finely tuned systems, cycles, and physical parameters that would sustain life. We were always given careful instruction to take care of it. Our role was that of a caretaker and not owners, a distinction that is misunderstood by Western values today. Those values include ownership, extraction, and depletion. But to my native people, the lands have always belonged to the creator. We have been given careful instruction to not overuse the land and allow it to rest during certain times. The creator expects us to live sustainable, resourceful lives. We have been instructed to leave an inheritance for those yet to come. The Iroquois people have a beautiful concept. Their leaders don't make any decisions without considering what effects that decision would have on seven generations ahead. What a beautiful concept. The land that the colonizers first put their eyes on was not untouched or wild, as some have recorded, but rather the result of a broad range of indigenous land management techniques. In the late 1800s, John Muir said that the Indians walked softly and hurt the landscape more hardly more than a bird or a squirrel. And as a result, the land that the Europeans first arrived on was rich, fertile, well-organized and tended. Our people did not struggle against nature. They worked within the set bounds out of a spirit of respect. We took no more than we could use and used all that we could from what we took, always making sure to put the time and the effort back into the land so that continue to yield for generations to come. In May of 2017, while on a visit to the massacre site, I had an idea. The tribe had recently come into a little money. I started to have a conversation with local farmers on who owned the massacre site land. They told me that the most of the land was owned by one man. 550 acres was owned by a man named Ralph Johnson, who had long passed away. They talked fondly of Ralph and what a nice man he was. They told me his children owned it now and his son was the caretaker. They gave me his name. He was an attorney in Salt Lake City. With just that little information, I tracked him down the next day and I made a phone call. After being on, put on hold for what I thought was an eternity, a soft, gentle spoken man said, this is Ralph Johnson. I told him my name was Darren Perry. I was the chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. And I told him I wanted to talk to him about purchasing all of his land near Preston, Idaho. After a long, uncomfortable pause, he said, I've been waiting for your call. Over the next eight months, we had a weekly telephone call. There were many times when he would say, Darren, don't get upset. 
this is just negotiations. I think he could sense my urgency. He knew how important this land was to me and my people. And finally, on July, January 29th, 2018, which ironically is the anniversary of the Bear River Massacre, I was able to announce that we just purchased 550 acres of that sacred burial site. I still haven't met Ralph Johnson to this day, face to face, but I will. We were now once again stewards over this sacred space. How ironic though, that we had to purchase back the land that our people called home for centuries. This land purchase was one of the most significant events in our tribe's history. It means everything to a small tribe. Not only was Bear River home for centuries, but it's a sacred burial site where more than 400 of my people, brothers and sisters still lay today. I believe with all my heart that those who died that day at Bear River played a significant part in the purchase of that land. I have felt their influences many times as they pushed me along and opened seemingly impossible doors for things to happen. Their voices have always spoken to me from the dust. They want their story told. But you know, as important as it is to tell the story of the people, it's equally as important to tell the story of the land. We do this by giving the land and our animal kinfolk, as my grandmother called them, a voice. Robin Wall Kimmer said, it's not enough to know the names of the plants. We need to know their songs. My grandmother knew their songs. Another key part of this process was for me to begin to develop partnerships and pull people together with ex specific expertise in a given field. This was done very early on in the process. Once we obtained the land, it was important for me to get scientists involved that knew much more about this process than I did. My first visit was to Utah State University where I met with professors Mark Brunson and Chris Lukey. I told them I wanted to restore the land to what it looked like in 1863 using my grandmother's plant diary as our guide. I wanted to know if it was feasible. And I wanted them to know that I didn't possess the skill set necessary to pull something like this off. Our first interaction back in 2018, I know what day it was because I, that day I got diagnosed with cancer. But that first interaction three years ago has brought us where we are today. Some of the things that we'd like to accomplish are going to require buy-in from the landowners upstream. They will have to change some of their farming techniques for us to accomplish our goals. How are they going to feel about doing things differently? How will they feel about the reintroduction of beaver into the ecosystem? Can they see the benefit of doing things differently in an environmentally friendly way, as opposed to the way they've been doing things for decades? And lastly, accomplishing our goals is going to require ongoing funding for many different sources for many different years. This partnership that we have developed between our nation and the science and the students at Utah State University has just begun. This will be a living learning classroom for decades to come. It requires more than removing non native plants and planting new seeds. It involves restoring watersheds, 
It's not a project that we can do alone. As my good friend who's here tonight, Will Munger has said, healing begins when you bring people together. The reality though, of finally being able to tell our story from our perspective is powerful to me. The purchase of the massacre site will help our people reconnect to this sacred space while providing a new emphasis as stewards. Voices that have been quiet for centuries are now going to be heard. Alliances between us, community groups in Utah State University and other people will help us bring back what we thought was lost forever. As important as the habitat restoration is, the preservation of our people and their stories is equally as important. Thankfully, we're now just now being able to bring back that narrative. So Sarah, she tending? Kids? Oh, I, do, I don't. To... That scares the crap out of me. I, I can do it. I'll, I'll progress and then you can tell you, people. You go. You're on, Maybe? Sarah. Hurry. Before they make me do Hurry, something with technology. technology. There we go. That's a cash valley. That's my grandmother who I got to learn at her feet. She met presidents. She testified in Congress 10 times. And that's the spot I'd sit and she'd tell me stories. Sarah, save me here. Save me. Okay, I have never done a talk with my two-year-old in tow. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. I still have a lot to learn about parenting from Darren and other things. <laughs> yeah. Um, fortunately, I was able to read his talk beforehand. So even though I had to be out with my daughter, I do roughly know what he said. So um, this is the motley team of people we have uh, gathered together. And um, I, Will Munger is right here in the audience. And I want to recognize um, Brad Perry um, has done quite a bit of coordination too. And um, this is a little image of the hot springs. And my daughter is up past her bedtime. <laughs> it's okay, Sophia. It's okay. Let's see. I might be able to talk and have her at my feet at the same time. We'll see. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. I didn't realize this would happen. Um, yeah. So we're here tonight to talk about restoration and restoration. And Darren is he gives me goosebumps whenever I hear him talk. And I think he has been a master storyteller, uh, re retelling the story of what happened in this really sacred and also a site of tragedy um, and motivating people to come together to, to retell what happened here from a different perspective. And, um, Will and Darren and I, we all sat at Crumb Brothers, which is one of my favorite places in Logan one day. And we, we sat down and I was like, okay, I'm an academic. I have to think about conceptual frameworks and boxy circle diagrams. And we sat down and <laughs> we created this overview of our project. And it has some symbolic elements too. So the braid, supporting this healing effort is braiding indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, and Western scientific knowledge. And that's all to support this healing, healing from the injustices uh, connected to indigenous history in this part of the world, um, healing tribal and settler institutional relationships. We should acknowledge, right, now that USU and many, most all land grant universities across America, they began because land was largely stolen from indigenous people or tribes might've been given pennies on the dollar 
for their land. And that created the seed money for the whole um, university, USU, and many other land grant universities across the country. So we really need to confront that history and do what we can to address those historic injustices. And then this is also a project related to healing relationships to land. And um, this can take many forms. Um, this land has been used for ranching and agricultural purposes for a couple generations now. And um, you can see those scars on the land. Um, but we think that with enough of this knowledge coming together to support this healing, we can really regenerate this site. And we can um, do what we can to express reverence for Northwestern Band of Shoshone culture, reverence for nature at this site, um, and show the resilience, not only of the land, but also of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation as a people. The massacre was 300 to 400 deaths, but that wasn't the end of the tribe. They are still here. They still, as Darren so masterfully has demonstrated, have so many stories to tell us and to share with us. So that's kind of like the overview of this project. In the restoration, we have a lot of plans for um, the, the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone is going to have tribal events on the site. There's going to be an amphitheater. There's going to be a cultural center. Um, we're also planning to do community engagement at the site. Um, Darren knows everybody in this part of the world and can probably get Boy Scout clubs and Girl Scout clubs and all sorts of different organizations to come out to the site and attend events that are organized by the tribe and maybe help us pull some invasive species out and plant some native species. So we're gonna to try to mobilize a lot of volunteers and we're really grateful for Sageland Collaborative because we know mobilizing volunteers is one of their specialties. Um, and this summer, um, we're excited to host some native summer interns. We've got this grant from Wildlife Conservation Society. We're gonna hire some uh, indigenous youth interns Hopefully they will be able to interview some elders in the tribe to talk to them about how the elders related to the land, the important animals and plants uh, in their culture to, to document it and help with this intergenerational transmission of knowledge. So we've got lots of plans on the, the restoration side. And I think Darren's playing a major leadership role there. And then there's this restoration and if you go out to the site and you're like me you have this really fun toy that flies around in the sky and you can take some images of my little um unmanned aerial system otherwise known as a drone which um sometimes darren flies it for me um you can see in this imagery though this is a heavily modified landscape. This has been pasture land it's got pretty thin soil that ditch right there that's where Beaver Creek, well, the Shoshone call it Beaver Creek. The um, settlers named it Battle Creek. Battle Creek runs in a ditch through this land um, that the tribe purchased. And we have big plans. Um, so it, it looks a little thin right now. Um, you can also see when, the, when my, it gets the right angle, the, the water quality in this ditch that used to be a stream is really bad. So we are going to, with the help of lots and lots of people, um, hydro engineers and um, other construction managers, we're gonna transform this to a multi-story canopy, riparian canopy with lots of different species. Um, and uh, we think we've found the right collaborators to make this happen. So here again, this is an overview of the site, the yellow, are the lands that the tribe has purchased. Um, the star is the site of the future cultural interpretive center. There's the hot springs and then the pro, pro stream restoration. Um, that's that beaver battle creek that runs right into the Bear River. And um, we're gonna focus a lot of our initial energy there. Um, so as I was saying, we're, our goal is this riparian cottonwood gallery. Um, and we're going to really try to reduce the sediment load by a lot that's currently in the Beaver Battle Creek. It looks like chocolate milk right now, and we're going to do what we can to improve that water quality. And then ideally, we're going to bring back more uh, indigenous fish like um, trout, 
cutthroat trout and other native fish species. Uh, right now, there's no way that trout can live in that chocolate milk uh, ditch, but um, 10, 20 years from now, it might be possible. Um, we're also hoping that we can improve habitat for trumpeter swans, for beavers, for eagles, maybe some moose um, and um, mule deer. So there's lots of different species that we hope to increase their abundance at this site. Um, and we also want to know more stories about these species uh, from the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation and use this wildlife to help tell their stories about how the Shoshone related to the land in the past and even how they relate to the land currently. So we have this vision of what this increased abundance and diversity of species could look like. Um, we have a lot of tasks that we're going to be accomplishing in the next few years. Um, a major one is to remove invasive species. We have to design channel restoration. Um, <laughs> she's going to be coming out to the site with me a lot. So maybe, you know, <laughs> um, we're going to try to generate biochar, which I'll go into a little bit more and do process based restoration. We've also got to really restore the native vegetation. There's a lot of invasive species there right now. And we want to find opportunities for upstream water quality because there's a lot that can be done on the site. But if we really want to address water quality, we have to have relationships with the people upstream and ultimately see what we can do about altering some land management so that it's not chocolate milk by the time Battle Creek hits Bear River. Um, and we're also going to build monitoring into our restoration plan. So on the remo removing invasive species front, um, Will Munger was a Utah Conservation Corps volunteer back in the day. And I think he maintained some relationships with this fantastic organization. They came to the site for what, two months, month and a half. And they did so much work. I have so much respect for them. They got rid of so much Russian olive, which is a really difficult tree to work with. It is spiny. It like hurts to touch. And then the cliche is that if you chop down a Russian olive, a thousand saplings come to its funeral. It's really hard to get rid of. And like, there's really basically no way besides manually doing it and then applying like surgical application of pesticides, um, of herbicides. And uh, the Utah Conservation Corps um, did a pretty amazing job right along that um, Beaver Battle Creek um, running parallel with the highway. And that had to happen first before we can do the next steps. So again, I've got some footage here. Um, this used to um, have Russian olives all around there. And these are piles of Russian olives that they chopped down. And um, this is going to make more space for, um, I'm showing them, we chopped down, the Utah Conservation Corps chopped down invasive trees. Yes, see, this is the chocolate milk. Sophia, you know what chocolate milk is, right? You can see that really high sediment load coming from Beaver or Battle Creek here. And um, yeah, those are more Russian olive piles. Um, this is gonna be the site where we do the initial earthworks, where we're gonna create a braided river, um, a braided stream. Um, <laughs> We want to create a braided stream so it'll support all those animals and plants that we like, that, that the Shoshone relied on since time immemorial. So all red restoration is gonna, has made this vision. So this is what the site more or less looks like now. And this is kind of like 20, 30 years when she's an adult. <laughs> it's so crazy to think about, but yeah, we're, that's, that's a vision for what the future could be like with beaver and trumpeter swans and uh, uh, cutthroat trout living in that area. And um, there's not many places like that in this part of the world with that um, kind of like abundance of native species. So that's that's what we're working towards. And you know, safety first. When you do biochar, you gotta wear a life jacket. Um, <laughs> this was, uh, we canoed along the Bear River this summer, and um, we've uh, partnered with a biochar extension professional at USU and created these test biochar using 
the um, Russian olive that was uh, taken down. And um, we're hoping that we can sequester this biochar. So biochar is burning um, shrubbery, trees, vegetation under low oxygen conditions. And that um, releases some carbon, but a lot of carbon is kept in the, it looks like charcoal. And then you can bury that charcoal. If you've read um, Drawdown by Paul Hawken, biochar and expanding it is one of the top solutions to climate change. And we're gonna do some experiments with this because we gotta get rid of the Russian olives somehow. And we could get a giant truck in there and truck it off to a landfill, but we're hoping to find a more organic, shall we say, solution to this. So we're experimenting, but man, Russian olive, not only does it have thorns and it's like not good habitat for birds and it sucks up a lot of water, it also has a pH uh, that's like baking soda once you convert it into biochar. So we have to figure out how to buffer, how to reduce, um, how to make it more acidic or more basic, more neutral, sorry. And um, we have ideas around that, but we are definitely looking for a so soil scientist to uh, advise us and work with us. Um, our current thoughts are doing some experiments related to adding a readily available resource called cow manure that uh, there's this uh, cow operation just up the hill from uh, the site. And hopefully they could give us a really good bargain on cow manure to try mixing that with the biochar. Um, steer manure. Oh, okay. See, I don't know. This is fantastic. I guess what the last time I talked with Darren um, at an audience in Hiram, there's this um, rancher who's like, why don't you add some carp? Like grind up the like invasive carp and on that canoe trip. I, I can't remember if it was the one you were on or one earlier. There's a lot of carp in this area. They really like the hot springs. So like how cool would it be if you could combine two invasive species and then sequester carbon and provide more or less fertilizer for native species to come back to the land. So we really need to explore that possibility more. And um, I, maybe I'll get some undergrads to go carp fishing and uh, put it in a blender and add it to some biochar. We'll see. I mean, carp do not belong in this ecosystem. And man, they're doing a little too well right now. Um, so now I'm going to hand it off to PhD student Will Munger, who is much more qualified to talk about beavers. He's actually a certified beaver, what was the word, wrangler? <laughs> But he'll tell you all about beaver dam analogs. So good evening. It's great to be here with y'all. Yeah, you think wrangling beavers are hard? Try two-year-olds. <laughs> Dang. Um, also reminds me that um, it's a real honor to be part of a very intergenerational process. And Darren tells this story about his grandmother being 13 at the time when the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers Monument was put up. This is actually around the same time a lot of Confederate monuments were being put up in the 1920s and 30s. And similarly, uh, the monument erased the Shoshone experience and valorized the colonial violence. And Dern talks about how his grandmother was 13 at the time and perhaps saw this and it began this lifetime of activism. And I think that that's the, the, what I wanna start with is honoring that lifetime of activism because she passed those stories down, passed that power down which then has led future generations to now be able to be in the position to do the land back thing. And more so, think about how that land back is involved with cultural revitalization, um, bringing back language, bringing back stories. And so um, I was in third grade when I went to the Bear River Massacre site for the first time. I grew up in Northern Cache Valley and had a teacher that brought me there. And when I was in third grade, I remember going out probably in like February about this time and it was cold. And there were piles of pickup trucks, and washing machines, old mattresses. And I remember being as a young person so struck that the violence inflicted on native people is related to the violence that's inflicted on the land. And I think that that's something that we see in so many different contexts, whether it's uh, Standing Rock, whether it's violence against water and land defenders around the continent, 
um, whether it's the violence in the energy transition where lithium mines are now being proposed on indigenous land. So there's a lot of interesting and cool ideas of how we do ecological restoration, how we do an energy transition. But the question about coloniality and the legacy of domination remains. And what I want to throw and start out with is saying we have to change that relationship. We have to think about what co-management means, what uh, being humble in science means, thinking about how we go slow and respect the knowledge of elders, respect the, the rage of young people who are raging not only against the changing climate, but against so many government systems that uh, prevent our, our agency from being realized. Um, but then there's small opportunities for collaboration. And that's really kind of what I want to um, honor today is all the work that goes into that. Because while you know we have great slides and cool images, the hard work is coming in that relationship building. And they don't teach scientists that in graduate school. No one ever taught, you know, how do you do decolonial land restoration? Like, you know, I learn, you know, from my peers who are doing this. I, I learn from um, people around the world who are trying to do this. And so I think beginning with the real humility is crucial that we don't, as scientists, have all the answers. And the question is, how do we figure out how to live on this planet together and heal from these colonial wounds in the context of a changing climate? And that's really what I want to talk about next. So when we think about restoring the landscape to what it was like when the Shoshone were managers, there's some challenges. Sarah's lined out um, impacts from agriculture, cropping, um, grazing systems, and those are all real. But the reality is that uh, we are already facing about um, a, a one and a half degrees of warming, which will significantly alter everything from precipitation regimes, when we get our snowpack, when the rain comes, when it doesn't come, to um, when flowers are blooming and how that might mismatch with pollinators, how the water runs off of a landscape with increased uh, soil aridity. So there's a lot of problems to deal with. Um, I'm a student right now at Utah State in the Climate Adaptation Science Program, which is an interdisciplinary program that brings together different young scientists to figure out how we work across disciplinary boundaries to address these complex issues with climate adaptation. Um, and we have new folks uh, uh, coming in and joining us. And I also want to throw out that if you're a young person watching this, we need you, the world needs you, and you don't have to be a scientist. Um, you can be a farmhand next door helping bring some manure to an experimental site. You can help with planting. You don't need to be a specialist. What you need is to have relationships. And those relationships are fundamentally about listening to land, listening to history, um, and thinking about how you fit in that historical moment, what Grace Lee Boggs calls the, what time is it? From the clock of world history. So sometimes it's beaver time. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So beavers, why are they awesome? Um, Beavers are watershed engineers. They are the OG watershed engineers. And um, this little thing called extirpation, where they were trapped out almost to extinction in this area, had huge impacts, not only on the biology, but on the hydrology as well, how that water moves.
Okay, we'll try that again. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so um, as the water is moving through the system, um, when it hits these beaver dams, it slows, it sinks, it spreads, it creates habitat. We want to augment that. We want to spread that out. But what do we do about beavers that are plugging up irrigation intakes? How about culverts and roads? What's our adaptive management plan to live with beaver? These are some of the questions that have to be considered. Um, but uh, this question about how do we restore uh, culturally important medicinal and food species in a changing climate is something that we have to consider. What is the indigenous knowledge that um, people like Maitim Bimbu Perry left to us? So Darren mentioned, um, when this restoration project began, it started with uh, May's plant diary, um, these hand-drawn images of food and medicine plants, where they were used, what time of year they were gathered, how they were used. Um, and this incredible treasure trove of information and knowledge is kind of at the center of where we want to begin uh, this process. Um, the stories that were told um, about how people survived the Calvary in the willows, those willows don't exist to the same degree as they do today. So how do we bring those willow back? How we, do we bring the cottonwood back to create that complex multi-strata uh, overstory uh, over the river to shade uh, the creek so that not as much water evaporates and to create conditions where fish can be. And you see these rippling ecological effects and I should definitely not get too far down that rabbit hole because I will talk in your ear all night long. All right, let's talk about climate change for a sec. Um, so uh, our team at Utah State in the Climate Adaptation Science Program, when we uh, started working uh, with the Northwest Band of Shoshone, we wanted to think about what are vulnerabilities of these culturally important species to future climate change? How can we begin to understand that? And so we had some really brilliant uh, data modelers that basically combined climate models, so models of the physical world, how heat is exchanged across the world, and how species distribution models are related to that. So a species distribution model is, you know, what is the range of, say, a Fremont cottonwood, north to south? And we can use um, open source information like iNaturalist, for example, to map that. Um, and this is something just about anyone can do. And we can also look at how these distributions change over time and what are statistically important variables in that, whether it's evapotranspiration, precipitation, these sort of things. And then we can create a model based that is bottom axis here are culturally important species. Um, and these are two different emission scenarios. This is a high emission scenario, business as usual. This is a medium emission scenario, which means that we're all getting off our butt and demanding climate action and changing a lot of policy and being really involved. So even in the best case scenario, looking at really significant risks to these culturally important species. And this means two things. One, we have to act now. And I wanna give a lot of credit uh, to Darren because during his congressional campaign during 2020, he was in the Uinta Basin in the oil field talking about a just transition. He was at Hill Air Force Base talking about how do we make sure all institutions in Utah are laser focused on climate mitigation and adaptation. And that sort of leadership is what we need. And we need a leaderful sort of moment where all of us are involved. And I think I'm probably preaching to the choir to a certain bit here, but if you're out in Zoom land, let's go. Um, but let's look for some patterns here, right? So what we, um, Forbes are over here on the left, grasses are in the middle, shrubs and trees are on the other side. Um, Forbes are facing some trouble, it definitely looks like that. Grasses, kind of a mixed bag. Um, aspen and chokecherry, definitely looking rough. Um, but riparian species seem to have some sort of resiliency according to these species distribution models. Now remember, these are computer models. This isn't real life. Um, the one thing that is missing is our agency in this, right? And so process-based restoration, restoring these watersheds can help limit the vulnerability and risks to future climate change, which is why collaborative watershed restoration is such an important climate adaptation task that we can take on now. Um, but we can't do this alone, right? The, the, the site itself is at the confluence of Beaver Creek and the Bear River but upstream where most of the sediment is coming in is a mosaic of farms and ranches, people who have attended to that land for a long time and also have local knowledge about how that stewardship um, has carried out, why they practice the cropping practices that they do. And here's the opportunities for us to work together, creating riparian buffer strips, uh, changing cover cropping practices, uh, intercropping practices, um, moving cattle drinking infrastructure off of the riparian area itself into upland areas. There's a number of practices with a lot of evidence on how you clean up watersheds. This has been something that's done all over the country. And now we'd like to begin that in uh, the Beaver Battle Creek watershed. Um, but fundamentally, that's also about listening to the needs of ranchers, to the needs of farmers, and figuring out where is their common ground. So 
over the last couple of years, we've set out and done a series of interviews with farmers and ranchers to understand uh, what are their perceptions, what are their, they view the risks, what do they view the benefits as, and we found a surprising degree of alignment. Um, people want to support mule deer habitat. Uh, people want to address uh, Russian olive. Um, people are um, justifiably concerned about risks uh, with in reintroducing beaver, and our adaptive management plans has to take that into account because ultimately, water flows how water flows, and we have to all work together to heal it. Um, this is a, a map that might be a little hard to see, but this is the watershed up here. If anyone's ever been up there, this is Treasureton Reservoir down here, uh, and the Bear River is coming down here. Um, this is uh, some watershed uh, mapping that I did with a team um, of undergraduates in the Native American in STEM mentorship program. Uh, these are students who came in uh, and did science with us last summer. And we're um, mapping turbidity throughout the watershed. Turbidity is measured in nephrometrical uh, turbidity units, or NTUs. And the parameters for healthy uh, trout is usually under 10 NTUs. And you can see right at the bottom of Treasureton Reservoir, it's coming out at 8.27. This is why it's a blue ribbon trout fishery. Yet you can see it pick up 20, 34, 54, dropping back down to 10 underneath the beaver dam. Um, and then picking it back up to 50, uh, 123 to 154 as it enters the Bear River. So there's a couple things to think about here. Um, one is the making the connection between the health of the Great Salt Lake and the Bear River bird estuary downstream and upstream management practices. When we think about how do we systematically deal with water issues in the Great Salt Lake, indigenous-led land reclamation projects and getting in-stream flows and restoration back in is a really good start. How do we scale that up? That's a question that we have to think about collectively. And ultimately, um, it's gonna take all of us being involved in our watershed, caring for our watershed, monitoring our watershed, um, making sure that there's opportunities for students who have been historically excluded from science and land grant institutions to have an opportunity to be paid to be the next generation of scientists. Um, that involves funding structures, support structures, mentoring structures, and that's the work ahead. It's not just that work on the land, it's the, our work in our relationships with each other, but also thinking critically about the role of land grant institutions. And ultimately, we just couldn't do this without partners. Um, this project is led by the Northwest Band of the Shoshone Nation, it's ultimately their land, their project, but there's a huge team that we've built to support this sort of effort. And I'm really happy to be here with Sageland um, and really kind of expand um, who is being involved with this. Um, and with that, let's uh, maybe take some questions. Oh, by Darren's book. If you haven't bought his book, just just go get it. He'll he'll mail you a copy. Hit him up on Twitter. <laughs> All right, we want to do Q and A here. Heck yeah! Thank you. So we're gonna have some questions from Zoom and questions in the room as well. So Hunter, if you wanna just let me know when you have one and pipe in. Okay. Background, uh, if you're on Zoom and you have any questions, please shoot them over to us through the Q&A or in the chat. And we'll let Sarah get started with questions here. Wonderful, okay, we have one right here. Thank you, first of all, all of you so much for this presentation. Um, um, I am in the landscaping and nursery business, and this is my passion, what you're addressing tonight, and um, would very much like to be part of this effort, but the question is around farming practices um, and changing views of what pollution looks like. Uh, Pesticides, you said pesticides, but pesticides and herbicides are the same thing, exactly the same thing. They're just different applications. And how, how much of a barrier is Native American practice of land management to the local farmer and his or her use of pesticides and herbicides. Yeah, there's a chasm here of understanding. And, you know, I, I'm up in that area a lot. And I talk to a lot of people. I thought everybody loves me. I thought all the farmers love me. I, everybody I met, I thought, oh, 
I have a good relationship with those people until one of the grad students went and interviewed these farmers. And then, you know, they said, well, one farmer said, well, the Shoshones, I, you know, I, I guess I get what they're doing, but they don't understand because they're outsiders. I and I just thought, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. And so, but for me, it's, it's, it gives me an opportunity. It's more about education to me and, and doing it in a way that's not confrontational. That's how can we work together to make this better? Cause I know you want it better too. And so I'm always all about that. And so uh, I just look at it as a, well, <laughs> it's an educational opportunity. I haven't done my work. I, I failed in some way. I need to make sure I'm educating these people into ways that I think will be better for them in the long run and better for all of us. So. I'll just chime in with my social science background and Will and I have talked about this a lot. Um, we're very self-aware that we're, I am a scientist. Will, you're a scientist. You're going to become Dr. Munger sometime <laughs> soon. <laughs> Um, and we know that we're not the right people to talk to ranchers and landowners. So um, USU has some relationships with people who have done amazing beaver on their own private land, and they are successful, well-respected members of the community up there. So what we're going to try to do is have these people who have done beaver restoration talk to other landowners and farmers and ranchers about their success and challenges um, doing things that bring biodiversity back. So we're trying to be really aware of like our identities, um, might also be a reason why I send young, naive grad students out to do the interviews because they're not a threat or anything. Um, but we like, I feel like I need to learn why the status quo exists in the way it does to better inform potential levers or, uh, what's the word? Um, like points of change in the system. I, I'm still very much in the learning phase. Um, and I think Sarah Woodbury is gonna be fantastic for talking with landowners and understand why things are the way they are. And then like understanding, is it a financial barrier? Is it, um, they need their cows to have better, easy access to water? Like, are there subsidies that we could help point them to, or even potentially, I mean, maybe the tribe could get a grant to help with riparian buffer planting and fencing and building alternative um, watering um, infrastructure to help improve water quality. I don't know these things yet, but hopefully Sarah will help me figure them out. <laughs> um. I am a rancher and I have farmed and I've um, kind of used the gamut of tools that are out there. And um, when I talk to farmers and ranchers in this watershed, um, one thing that becomes very clear is they're, um, they have continued their operation not because of bad management decisions, but of making the best decisions they can uh, within the constraints that are available to them. And within our current economic system, um, it is the easiest and most profitable thing to do to maximize profit at the expense of future generations and externalize uh, the cost of that on the world. That's just kind of how our capitalist economic system works, and we should clearly change that. But in the meantime, how do we work in that context? Um, so what Sarah is talking about in terms of um, conservation incentive structures, there definitely is a growing field of evidence that those can be seriously effective. Um, but also the horizontal learning. Ranchers and farmers are going to learn best from ranchers and farmers. And it just so happens that folks like Jay Wild have pioneered beaver reintroduction, um, the next watershed up from this. And, um, you know, he tells this story um, of uh, growing up fishing on his pond uh, near Mink Creek, just upstream. Um, and by the time he came back as an older man, that pond had dried up. And over the next couple of years, he worked with watershed scientists and brought beavers back. And now uh, his granddaughter is translocating uh, beavers, and he is one of the bigger beaver believers out there. And he's probably the best ambassador for why uh, beavers can help ranching operations by increasing uh, the forage production in those riparian areas uh, and practicing good grazing management that's not overgrazing, but regeneratively grazing. And so I think um, rather than viewing people as kind of 
enemies. I think we need to view them as uh, potential allies and collaborators. The question is, how do we build those relationships? Trust. Do you come in saying, you need to change everything. You've messed up the environment. You're a colonizer. Maybe, but would you listen to anyone that came in busting and pointing their finger like, yeah, I know I would have a little trouble with that. Um, and so approach matters. And that's where I think I learned so much from Darren in terms of how he uh, approaches by saying, well, what do we have in common? And what uh, how can we make the future a better place? And I think uh, learning that rhetoric, learning the intergenerational skills involved in that this is a long haul struggle, you know, like um, when Sophia is now is going to be my age, that's kind of the beginning of like when we hopefully will see, see success. If Darren's great, great, great grandkids can go there and remember the generation that began the restoration that's still going on at that time, then we've made some success. And I think uh, a, a person like me, who is at a land grant institution, we have to think critically about how we support that long haul process when the funding structure rewards two to three year cycles. They're not thinking on that big long cycle. And that's something we have to talk about and change. NRCS is definitely partners, um, and we've met with uh, Idaho NRCS, and our project manager, uh, uh, Brad Perry, is currently negotiating with them. Um, so yes, we really look forward to, to working with them. One thing that we uh, really realized very quickly um, in working with NRCS is just how much knowledge is in that area in farmers and ranchers about different seed mixes, what works, what doesn't. Um, the silly projects that scientists have tried in the past, like, for example, introducing Russian olive as an erosion control mechanism. We were actually removing Russian olive with the UCC, and an old, old boy came up and said, oh, I remember when they put that stuff in. I was a student at Utah State, and I thought, dang. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so yes, NRCS is great. We're looking forward to working with them. Just to make sure to hold it. There it goes. Yeah, yeah, you're on. Um, I'll just say that NRCS is funding the earthworks component, which is very expensive to take a stream out of a ditch and create a braided river ultimately. So yeah, NRCS is providing the resources necessary to make that vision a reality. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your knowledge today. Um, my question is, how do the legislative water rights impact the management plan of this watershed? And if you could speak to that a little bit more, that'd be great, thank you. Um, so we live in the West and so prior appropriation and use it or lose it is kind of the law of the land, um, which means that in-stream flows for ecological beneficial use are not currently recognized. Now, some of the water banking proposals that are in front of the legislature right now would mean that state agencies would lease upstream water, say from the Northwest band of the Shoshone and pay them to put that water back into the in-stream flows or other farmers and ranchers uh, involved in that as well. So I think that the implications are twofold. One, that we do have to reconsider our, our water policy frameworks in an era of climate change and thinking about updated hydrological accounting as well as future variability. Um, also, we need to fundamentally think about water governance structures and how we make those participatory um, and thinking about the benefit of future generations of more than human kinships as well. Um, and so um, that is a long winded answer to say we got some work to do. He forgets more in a day than I do in that. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add the little detail, which I think is interesting, that um, through the purchase of this land, the tribe also acquired water rights, and um, some of those water rights historically were used for ranching and agriculture, and the plan for the tribe is to use them to help improve the habitat. So there's going to, and also there's been some drilling, and they found artisanal, I don't, I'm not a water scientist, so um, they found high quality uh, artisanal well uh, on the property. And um, yeah, there's gonna be some uh, diversion of water back into the stream, which is gonna be pretty cool. I, I would like to go, thank you. Thank you again for the presentation. It has been amazing to, to hear the work that you're both doing in terms of the 
traditional knowledge at the same time that the scientific knowledge. And like a, a question that is going in the same line, I would like to ask in terms of the policies that regulates type of land use uh, or any type of regulation for local or regional governments, do you find that as a restriction or as, a, uh, as an opportunity to develop the project that you're doing right now? I mean, is there any type of support for local, local governments or any type of interest? Or do you see that as a restriction to develop this project? Yes, local government is super important to this. Um, you know, this is happening in Franklin County, and you know, for example, the, the Franklin County road crew guys. Um, when we're out there, they'll come by and be like, "How can we help?" You know, they, they helped run um, some traffic safety control when we were dropping some Russian olive last fall. Um, but um, I think to, to your point, what I think is really crucially important is thinking about the watershed governance in the Bear River system. The Bear River is one of the largest tributaries to the Great Salt Lake, and so folks in Salt Lake. Are going to benefit from water being in there because that will mitigate dust, increase lake levels, and that sort of thing. But we don't have a governance structure around the Great Salt Lake. We do have the interstate tri-state compact around the, the Bear River, but not necessarily the Great Salt Lake. And so your point is well taken that um, there's a lot of work to do in terms of building those relationships um, locally. And I think that I just want to give Darren a shout out because he is constantly speaking at the Hiram Public Library or bringing uh, local middle school kids in from all over the West to learn about this sort of thing. So I think there's a great deal of intergenerational education and that, that can enable future generations to have more of a proactive role at the local government level. Do we have any on Zoom that we wanna throw in? Okay. I guess, sure, I'll, I'll just go. Um... Thank you for your presentation. I'm just, this is incredible. Uh, and I just wanted to ask about um, um, just something that I wasn't fully understanding. The site is also uh, uh, a place where a massacre occurred. Is, is it also like a burial site? And it, insofar as something has happened, I mean, something happened, uh, the question is like, what, how, how will this be memorialized um, and, and honor the lives that were lost there? Yeah, the history of it, and I guess you can buy my book and read about it, but, but <laughs> I think it's on sale on Amazon for five bucks. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, the, the the fast version is it's the site of one of the largest massacres in the history of the United States. Happened in 1863, uh, just outside of Preston, Idaho, and we believe uh, more than 400 of our people were massacred that day. Mm. Now, if you know anything about Cache Valley, it's like here, it's January, it's frozen. The survivors took off, not knowing if the army was coming back. And so nobody was ever buried. It's a sacred burial place for our people. I hear stories from old timers in Preston that said their grandparents who used to try to farm it would plow up human remains and they just quit and, and decided to run cattle on it instead. But those bones are just beneath the surface. And, and we know where the killing field is. My grandmother took me there. My grandmother's grandfather, who I talked about, Dabuzi, he was 12. He told the stories to my grandmother. So my grandmother was alive when he was an older man. And he would take her there and say, that's where I was in the hut. That's where I played dead. And that's where all the bodies are today we believe more than 400, which Sand Creek happens a year later, 100 and, and, and I don't wanna put a number and, and mean it's, this is more important because more have died, but it's a massacre that's largely been forgotten by history. And I talk to people in Cache Valley today that still don't know anything about it and they live 15 miles away. And so uh, it's extremely important to me to, you know, the only thing we have at the site there is a Daughters of Utah Pioneers Monument. And the whole monument talks about the brave soldiers and the pioneer women who took care of them at the end. That's what the plaque reads. And left out of the whole narrative is the people that died there. Mm -hmm. And and when Will talked at the first about my grandmother being a 13 year old girl when they unveiled that plaque, I am positive because I knew her my whole life 
she said, oh, hell no, this isn't how it's going to be remembered and worked her entire life to went to boarding school, came back, got her English degree and started writing down all of the stories. And so we have a huge uh, treasure trove of knowledge because of my grandmother. But she said to me, Darren, no one has ever wanted to hear our story before. One day you will have to make them listen. Well, I've not had to make anybody listen today. People want to know. And so once we got that land, I met with Utah State to restore the land because my grandmother talked about the plants and animals as kinfolk. They were as important to her as the people. And so that land restoration was really important. But to tell the story of the people so they don't read that plaque and, and they get a story from the people that suffered it. So I've been in a capital campaign to raise uh, $6 million to build an interpretive center on the site. And I'm getting there. I haven't got there yet, but we're always looking for donations to the site. And so uh, until that's done, my work is not done. I'm, I want to build that interpretive center to tell the story of our people from our perspective. And it's a story that's never been heard before. Thank you. One less poetic detail, and that is that um, <clears throat> preliminary archaeological and oral history points towards other areas of the site being the killing fields and the area that will be disturbed from the earthworks and from restoring the braided channel. That's not that's not where people were killed. So we want to be really cognizant, and you know, when we're burying biochar, we want to go to areas that were not where people died and be really respectful of that oral tradition about where things happened and um you know recognize the sacred grounds that need to be honored and then focus our restoration efforts um where the killing did not happen yeah and so when sarah brings up crazy ideas like carp biochar slurries we're talking off-site <laughs> um but yeah i think this speaks to the, the the difficulty of doing culturally sensitive science which i think requires us to expand our ethical principles beyond the belmont principles that are kind of the, the classic standard um and we need to think about self-determination we need to think about reparations we need to think about um deference um, and sometimes you have like a great scientific idea and it's just not the right place or time to do that. Or maybe you're not the right scientist to do that. So how else might you do, how, how might you be, use your creativity to think about asking some of these restoration questions in terms of the nuts and bolts um, and figure out a better way to do it. Great question. I got to uh, a few years ago, I, I got to meet with the presiding bishop of the church down in what I call the large and spacious building, this big tall one. They don't like it when I call it that, but that's what I call it. Tenth floor, the presiding bishop's on the tenth floor. So, but we're dear friends now. And I had dinner in his home and we, we, I shared this history before this meeting. He said, well, he's from France. He didn't know the history and I didn't expect him to. And so we uh, had a beautiful French dinner for three hours. It's all about conversation. And at the end, he was just really moved. And he said, you've got to come to my office and tell this story to other people. Well, I didn't know who the other people were, but one of the, the other people was the church historian who sat next to me as I'm telling. He said, Darren, take an hour and tell this story to these people. 
And at the end of it, the church historian became really angry and said, we didn't massacre anybody. And, and, and he was right. The army was the ones that perpetrated it, but it was the, the pioneers who lived in Cache Valley was the cause. And I said, what, I agree you did not fire a bullet that day, but your presence in the Cache Valley, your depletion of the resources, your fences and cattle who ate all the precious seeds. We only knew one way to live and that was hunt and gather. You, you forced us into starving, stealing or begging. And then when there's a problem, you call for somebody to come take care of the problem. You were absolutely the cause. And he didn't say anything to me then. And, but I want you to know the church has been really good to us in that respect. I, I'm never holding out for an apology. That's just not what they do. And so I'm okay with that. But the church did make a sizable donation to the building. And the state of Utah, the legislature gave a sizable donation to the building. Uh, almost a million dollars for a building in Idaho. So uh, that took a lot of lobbying efforts on my behalf to get that done. But very grateful for the church for what they've done and uh, for the state of Utah for what they've done. So I'm not holding out for an apology and I don't expect one. I wish they'd do more. And I, I, I would love to see an apology one day, but I'm not holding my breath for one and I'm okay if we don't get one. Okay, I saw a hand here. Um... I'm curious about what uh, early projects you have in mind and what that schedule looks like and anything you might know about that. Sure, like restoration projects. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there's different parts of the uh, property that the tribe owns and um, different things can move forward at different times. So um, in the, <clears throat> the multi-story riparian canopy that we're aiming to build with BioWest and All Red Engineering, um, that first requires some hydraulic modeling. We don't want to flood any highways. And um, we need to be make it resilient to fluctuations in precipitation, which are like, if you learn about climate, we're getting more and more variable precipitation. So um, that hydraulic modeling and then potentially earthworks could happen as early as this uh, spring and summer, and then maybe by fall with earthworks. I'm not exactly sure. And honestly, a lot is just waiting for this NRCS grant to come through and the federal government has been really slow about moving money lately. Um, so that all has to happen before the beaver dam analogs and opportunities for volunteers to get more involved in that area that's right near the highway. Um, but there's other areas that beavers already inhabit um, and we will likely be um, removing invasive species um, from those sites. Um, and we'll be experimenting with biochar this summer for sure. Um, let's see. Oh, and Will is going to head up um, making an on-site uh, plant nursery for um, willow and um, other plant propagules and probably some of the plants that were in May Timbimbu Perry's um, plant diary. And that should happen this summer, right? Yeah. I think the other place that community science makes a lot of sense is uh, helping with baseline monitoring to try to establish what the current conditions are. Um, we've had a great relationship with our local Audubon chapter and superheroes like Jack Green have been out there um, for a couple of years now, um, documenting migrating birds in the spring and the fall. Um, we uh, were able to do a uh, pollinator survey uh, last summer working with the ARS entomologists and the Native American and Science Mentorship Program. Um, so definitely stay tuned. I think Sageland Collaboration is a great um, uh, organization to kind of connect folks in the Wasatch Front with what's happening up there. Um, we're definitely excited about the possibility of building beaver dam analogs. 
Um, uh, right now, um, you know, I, we talked a little bit about some of the modeling we've done in terms of identifying the right places to put those in, where we can kind of contribute to already existing beaver populations and help them expand to deal with some of the watershed issues. Um, and so if you have experience in that, like come hit me up afterwards, but um, I definitely would say uh, stay tuned through Sageland collaboration because there will be uh, volunteer opportunities. Um, everything's going a bit slow with COVID, so be patient with us, but um, we'll get back to you. I think that's reasonable. Um, so Beth asked, are any of the desired species found anywhere upstream? So I guess the desired species you'd like to see more of. Yes, and I, I think this is a really great point about resilience. Although uh, the cottonwood and willow galleries have been degraded, um, there are pockets. Um, and one of the cool uh, parts about working uh, with the Native American in, in Science Mentorship Program is that uh, we did really extensive um, uh, walking um, along the watershed and found these pockets of local genetics of, of both coyote willow uh, and different cottonwoods. And so um, the uh, on-site nursery, we're hoping to take propagules from the, the locally adapted genetic stock um, and then build those out um, at scale to then replant areas that have been removed um, of Russian olive and then had some of these earthworks go in. So definitely um, being attuned to those local genetics and those local adaptations, I, I think is crucial. And then when we look ahead um, in a climate change future, are there going to be uh, propagules from say further south that might um, be more adaptive to, to future conditions? I think those are some of the questions around uh, assisted migration that are happening within um, restoration ecology and conservation biology. And I don't think we have any fast and easy answers about that, but it's certainly something we're trying to think about. Okay, let's do one more. I just have a couple simple questions, but there is so much knowledge here. The heart, the history, the brains, you need to have more kids because you can, <laughs> or kids because you're, your DNA would have fast little scientists just teaching the world, okay? She's doing her part and you've done your part. Anyway, <laughs> my question is, is there anything in the near future um, for changing the plaque? Yeah, well, the plaque's pretty horrific. And every year we hold the massacre commemoration at that side of the road. Well prior to us owning the land, we had nowhere else to go. So we had it right there by the monument. Well, the good thing with that is we'd have like 500 people show up, read the plaque the next day, call the Daughters of Utah Pioneers and go, what the is that? And, and then I'd get a call from them saying, man, we've been getting a lot of hate mail and emails and all kinds of things because it's really a horrific plaque. And I said, yeah, it is. And they said, well, there was an old president, national president, that says, well, we're not changing it. That's history. We're not changing it. President of what? The Daughters of Utah Pioneers. It's their land. But we can't really do anything anyway. And so, and then she retired. And they got a new one. And she called me and said, I'm the new president. How can we change that plaque? What would you like it to say? And so... Uh, I had them leave the plaque up and we put up a new plaque on the other side. My thinking is I'm not really a monument eraser per se. There are some monuments that absolutely need to come down around this country. I wanted the historical context of that time period to be there. And look, I'm not giving those people that lived back then a pass. I'm not saying it, well, they lived that long ago. They were all that way. There were people that lived that long ago that were not that way, that were not racist, that were not, that, that treated people with respect and dignity. So I'm not giving them a pass on, well, they lived that long ago. Uh, you know, we shouldn't judge them by our standards today. Absolutely, we can ju judge them by our standards today because there were people that didn't believe it like they did. So, but uh, they let me write the new plaque. They changed it a little bit, but the first sentence uh, they kept, which is what I wrote, and it says something like, here in this area, uh, 
more than 400 Shoshone men, women, and children were massacred at the hands of civilization. And then they went off on their own little tangent, but to soften it. But at least now we have both. And it's their monument. They could have told me to, we're not changing it ever, but they did. And so I think that's a pretty good, good thing. But I said, nobody's going to stop here when we have a beautiful interpretive center across the road. This is going to be an obsolete thing one day, but I don't know. But I'm grateful they changed it or let us put up an alternate narrative of one that reflects the truth. Well, I lived in Mink Crick. Did I hear you say Creek? It's Crick. Mink Crick, yeah. Okay. It's Crick until first grade and my grandfather farmed there did my family help ruin this area we I don't had know. to put beavers or the mink creek <laughs> <laughs> ran through our property i tell you one thing um with uh, important species like uh, cutthroat trout mink creek is the furthest uh, downstream tributary where those have been monitored in in recent years so some good things are happening on mink creek um, is there more things that could happen? Yes, and it's going to take people like us collaborating to do it. So let's talk. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and thanks again for being here. We really appreciate hearing about this inspiring story. It's it's wonderful to hear um, thinking toward the future about projects and what's possible. And I just I personally really appreciate it. So thank you all for being here again. Thanks as well to Swanner for hosting. This is a beautiful, beautiful place. It's been a wonderful evening. And thanks again for coming. Drive safe. Same thing. Thank you guys so much for everything. And uh, join us for more walks, talks, and workshops in the future.